Hi, and welcome to our session. Um, in the next 25 minutes or so, I will um, show you what we added in the la last uh, year to the Julia extension in Visual Studio Code. I will demo some of the parts. Uh, other parts will be demoed by other members of the core team of the Julia extension. But I want to stress uh, at the outset that uh, many of the new things that we added over the last year were actually contributed by other people. And so thank you to everyone who opened pull requests, opened issues, gave feedback, and helped us make this uh, extension better than it was uh, in the last year. So the first major new feature we want to showcase is support for native Jupyter notebooks in Visual Studio Code. And before I start to demo the Julia part of that, um, uh, we actually have a short message from our friends at Microsoft who built the core support for Jupyter notebooks and have been working with us and helped us a lot get this all worked out with Julia. So Claudia, take it away. Hi everyone, my name is Claudia and I'm a program manager at Microsoft, currently working on the Python Notebooks experience in VS Code. As some of you may remember, the Notebooks experience in VS Code originally started in the Python extension back in 2019. The Jupyter community gave us feedback that you all wanted to be able to use other languages with Notebooks in VS Code, and rightfully so. We went ahead and extracted all of the Jupyter Notebooks related code from the Python extension and ended up publishing the Jupyter extension in late 2020. With Julia's increasing popularity, we were really excited to partner with the Julia extension team and provide a notebooks experience paired with Julia's rich language support. We've been working really closely with the Julia team in order to enable notebooks in VS Code, and I'm really excited for David to go ahead and show you all the features that we've enabled, and I hope you guys enjoy it. I wish you guys a great JuliaCon 2021 and happy coding. So the biggest new feature in this release is probably the native notebook support for Jupyter Notebooks in VS Code. Uh, and we're hooking into the infrastructure that Claudia just described um, that is now shipping as part of Visual Studio Code itself. So Visual Studio Code itself now has UI for notebooks. And we're also hooking into the support for specifically Jupyter Notebooks that uh, Microsoft is shipping as part of the Jupyter extension. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to demo this uh, on this system here. Um, and what I have installed on the system is quite crucial. So installed here is Julia itself. I have installed Visual Studio Code. I have installed the Jupyter extension within Visual Studio Code. And I have installed the Julia extension. That's all. I have not configured anything. Uh, I have not installed any package uh, that is uh, uh, related to Jupyter. Uh, there's no iJulia package, for example, installed. Um, so I've really, in terms of supporting software infrastructure, it's really only VS Code, Julia, and the two extensions. Um, now I've opened here a folder that has a Jupyter notebook, example one, that I created in Jupyter Lab before this session. Uh, and if I uh, double click on that now inside uh, Visual Studio Code, then it opens up this notebook inside the native UI in Visual Studio Code. Uh, so that's what you see here. So you get the rich uh, uh, view of the, on this Jupyter notebook. You can uh, see all the markdown. You can see the code uh, elements here. And you can see the output, the plots that I've created in this notebook here. All right, so um, that is uh, all pretty standard here. Um, now, the question is, can I actually run anything? Uh, and remember, I have not installed Jupyter itself, nor have I installed iJulia. Um, but I can actually run things. Uh, and I'm going to do this in the following way. I'm going to clear all outputs in this notebook. So now we just have the code here, and then we're going to rerun everything uh, and see how that works. Um, so one way that I can do this is I can just uh, click on this little uh, play button here next to a code cell. If I click that button, it queues that cell up for execution. Uh, as soon as it starts to run, it, uh, a timer uh, appears. Uh, and now we can witness uh, the wonderful startup time of Julia for things. Um, I should say I'm recording this on a virtual machine that is uh, low powered. So, so I think the uh, timings that you see here uh, would be better in, in a real world scenario. So I ran this one cell here. Um, I can run the next cell here, so that will uh, create a plot. And here's our plot. 
So, so far, this is all probably very familiar uh, to users of uh, Jupyter Notebooks um, and a similar user experience to what you get if you use Jupyter Lab, for example. But you actually, at this point already, get some features with this native notebook integration with Julia that, that you don't have in any, any other uh, Jupyter Notebook client at the moment for Julia. So we can access this, these additional features by clicking on the Julia area uh, here, uh, and then we see the Julia workspace. And in the Julia workspace, we've traditionally only shown the variables from the Julia REPL, if you have one open. But now with notebook support, we also show one node here per notebook kernel that is currently running. So right now here I have a notebook kernel running for this particular notebook. And then I can drill down into this particular kernel and see all the variables that are loaded into that kernel. Uh, all the packages that are loaded into that kernel and so on. In the same way that you can drill down into the data structures in a REPL um, with this tool here. So for example here, I see that we have a global variable data. That's the global variable that I created here in this cell uh, and assigned some data to. And I can see that it's of type data frame. I can click this little button here to the, uh, the preview button. And that will open a rich tabular viewer for the data in this uh, variable. I can also drill down into this data structure. So if I click on this little expander button here, then it will show me the fields that the data frame type has. So here we have uh, a vector of columns. I can drill down into those and I will get uh, one element for each column that uh, is in here. And then I could drill down, for example, into the individual elements of that column that is a vector of the data frame. So you have the full richness here of the Julia workspace variable drill down for Jupyter kernels that run in, uh, and power a Jupyter notebook. So that is uh, something I think that is not present at the moment in any other Jupyter notebook implementation for with, in, in combination with Julia. Another benefit of using this native notebook experience is that you get the fantastic uh, editor from VS Code in for these cells here, including all the IntelliSense and help that we provide as part of the Julia extension for your Julia code. All right, so let me say a little bit about the underlying architecture, how we've implemented that, because I think that is actually one of the nicest uh, aspects uh, of this. So one of the biggest benefits of using this to work with Jupyter Notebooks, in my mind, is that there is no configuration that can go wrong and cause problems. So in a traditional Jupyter setup, the way it works is that you have to install the iJulia extension, the package, into Julia, and the iJulia package will then write some files in your file system that registers a Julia kernel with the Jupyter ecosystem. Now that works really quite reliable, but in principle, the configuration that is on disk can get out of sync with the current installation setup that you have. So for example, you might update your Julia version, might delete an old Julia version, but forget to update that kernel registration information. And all of a sudden your Jupyter setup does not work smoothly anymore. It's easy to fix, but it can still be quite annoying. With the architecture that we have here in Visual Studio Code, we get rid of all of that. There is no configuration. The way this works is that the Jupyter extension in Visual Studio Code understands how Jupyter Notebooks can be loaded and saved to disk, and then it hands off all execution of code to the Julia extension. And we're implementing the code running uh, parts of this completely inside our extension. We're not relying on any registration uh, files in the file system. We're not relying on any package being installed. So we don't use iJulia the package. We ship all the code that we need inside the uh, Julia extension for v VS Code. So you can never be in a situation that the package that you've installed is outdated or uh, anything like that. That can never happen. Um, there can never be a situation that the that you want to run some code in a Jupyter notebook uh, and you want to use a certain package, but iJulia, the package, wants to use a different version of the same package. Those problems are all gone because we handle all the code that is required to run code in Jupyter notebooks inside the Julia extension and there can never be a conflict between what you want to run and the code that we use for that. One final point, 
Uh, all of this, of course, works inside a local installation of Visual Studio Code, but it also works on the web. Um, as you know, uh, GitHub Code Spaces, for example, is a fully hosted version of Visual Studio Code on the web, powered by a virtual machine where you then run your uh, Julia code. I believe Julia Computing offers a similar feature with Julia Hub, where you can actually run Visual Studio Code in a web browser in the cloud. And this should all just work in that setting as well. So this is not a solution that just works locally in a locally installed VS Code instance. It also should work on uh, all the uh, web platforms where Visual Studio Code runs. So the next feature we're going to demo is a new plot gallery inside Visual Studio Code. And that feature is actually going to be demoed by Tony Long. Um, Tony is an undergraduate computer science student here at UC Berkeley, and he added that feature uh, over the last couple of months. And Tony, take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm Tony, a contributor to Julia VS Code extension. Today, I'm going to introduce you to a new feature of Julia VS Code extension, that is the plot gallery. The plot gallery will help you manage your plots efficiently. So let's get started. Then I'm going to open uh, a repo provided by Julia VS Code extension. So one way to open it is through the command palette um, and type repo and select Julia start repo. Um, here I already have a repo open and uh, libraries loaded and let's start plotting. So here I'm going to um, use the uh, Vega dataset to plot some interesting figures. Yeah, as you can see, the plot just pops up. And let's plot more. So, um, and let's plot from another dataset. As you plot more and more figures, it will be uh, very difficult to manage all the plots. But with Plot Gallery, it will be easier. Um, so to open Plot Gallery, you need to click the Julia icon on the left. And then um, under the Plot Navigator uh, bar, you'll be able to see uh, the thumbnails for the figures that you have just plotted. And click through um, these figures. You'll be able to load onto the main window. And if you um, want to delete a plot from the Plot Navigator, you could click on the delete button, just like before. Yeah. Um, if you want to save a figure, you could drag and drop the figure into um, a uh, local file system, local folder, or into your browser if you want to uh, make a blog post, for example. So yeah, as you can see, uh, the plot gallery makes it uh, more efficient and easier to manage all the plots. And um, we're we're always looking for more contributions from the community to enhance our plot gallery and all other features of our Julia VS Code extension. Thank you for viewing our video. So thank you, Tony. That was fantastic, both the demo and also the actual feature that you implemented there. And with that, we come to our next feature, and that is a speed up of our debugger that Sebastian implemented over the last year, and he will demo that. We've made substantial improvements to the speed of the integrated debugger in VS Code over the last year or so. Um, this has mostly been achieved by being a bit smarter about which function calls actually need to be compiled and which need to be interpreted to give the best debugging experience. Our assumption was that most users are only interested in stepping into or setting breakpoints in code they themselves wrote, or that's maybe somewhere in a package, but mostly not in base. Um, I'll just run this little piece of code here to make a Mandelbrot set um, to illustrate some performance pitfalls the current implementation has and um, that we've somewhat fixed at least. Um, as you can see, the code works fine. But, um, and we can even like, debug this code just fine, um, except when we're on a big domain, it's going to take forever to run. So this works fine. Um, breakpoints and jump around in our Mandel function here and uh, finish debugging. Um, but if we want to run this on a slightly bigger domain than the four points um, I've used here, 
for example, this domain, which has 1,100 points. Um, then the compiled function takes one millisecond in this machine. But the interpreted code, which is what the debugger uses, takes much, much longer. You can see it uh, yeah, still hasn't finished. It took 6.5 seconds. Uh, luckily, uh, the extension now ships with a set of compiled methods and modules, which you can apply here. As you can see, most of base is compiled, except for a few higher order functions and also other modules, um, mostly standard libraries, are also compiled. If I run uh, this code again, then it's going to take substantially less time. Um, we're still two orders of magnitude uh, from the compiled code, but this is a much better situation already. The next feature we're going to show is the ability to connect Julia to external REPLs, long-running REPL processes. That was another feature that Sebastian implemented, and here is his demo of that feature. Another cool feature we've worked on over the last few months is support for persistent sessions, be it on remote servers, as you can see I'm SSH'd into a remote here, or even on your local machine. You can enable uh, this with a Julia persistent session setting, which causes your Julia REPL to be started inside of a persistent Tmux session, which you can then um, handle yourself. I've already run most of the code in this uh, file, and I'll just run this make mandelbrot function again to produce a plot. As you can see, it just works. There was almost no startup delay because we only needed to connect to this already existing Julia session. The workspace is pre-populated and everything works the same as always. You can, for example, run long uh, running function calls inside of the Julia process, disconnect your notebook or whatever from the remote server and connect at a later point to check your results. The same feature also allows you to connect to arbitrary Julia processes on a local machine, which is nice if you want, for example, to run VS Code on one screen and the REPL on another. You can use that with a connect external REPL um, command in the command pane. One feature that we had in Juno that was missing for a while in VS Code is progress logging. And uh, Sebastian added that over the last year, and here is his demo of that feature. Another feature we've had in the extension for quite a bit now is support for progress path via the progresslogging.jl API, which is fairly simple. You can just use uh, the add progress macro in front of a for loop to automatically get this nice display down here, which gives you the completion percentage and the remaining time. These progress bars can be nested and you can give them names and so on and so forth. Just check the docs for more details. Um, and the UI also lets you cancel the computation, which basically just sends an interrupt exception to the Julia process with uh, the expected results, I suppose. You're also not limited to for loops here. Um, if you don't know the number of iterations it's gonna take to, for example, minimize an objective function, then you might use the add with progress and add log progress macros and give the user updates on the optimization status that way. Another new feature we have in the extension that makes life for package authors a little bit easier is an integrated package tagging functionality in Visual Studio Code. Uh, so here I'm in a folder that is a Julia package. It's called it's the String Builders package. It's the package where I always demo things. It's a very simple package. Uh, and let's make some change here uh, that is inconsequential. So I'm just going to add a empty line in this place here. Uh, I'm going to commit that change here. Add an empty line and now I'm going to pretend that this change warrants a new release of this package. Now I can start the command palette and I can look for this command called Julia tag new package version. It's still labeled experimental because it still is a little bit experimental, but I use it for all my packages and it works great and I know many others that use it as well. So I think it's ready to be tried out. So you click that and now you select what kind of release you want to tag. Uh, so do you want to create a new patch, minor, major release, or um, something else, custom, for example. So I think this does not warrant a major release, so I'm just going to create a patch release. So I select patch release here. 
Uh, and now a little script runs and it will essentially do everything that's needed to create a new patch release. Uh, and I'm going to describe to you what that actually entails. So the first thing is that it will create a new branch for that specific release. So it will create a branch that is called release dash and then the version number of the new release. Uh, it will automatically pick a version number that increases the patch number. So you don't have to do that. You don't have to manually increase version numbers in your project TOML anymore. The script actually handles that for you. So you can see here, it created a new branch called release dash 0.2.4. It then, uh, on this branch, uh, changes your project TOML to reflect this new version number. So it will increase the package version in the project TOML to 0.2.4. It will commit that. It will, t uh, will then add another commit where it actually increases the version number in your project TOML to 0.2.5-def. So it will automatically create another commit that is sort of one past the commit that will hopefully become uh, version 0.2.4. At that point, um, it will automatically create a pull request on GitHub for your package. And I'm going to go there right now. So let's open this in a web browser here. So here we are on the string builders uh, repository and I can go to pull requests. And it created a new pull request for this version called new version 0.2.4. Uh, and here you can see that for this pull request, it actually added two commits. One commit set version to 0.2. 2.4, and then another uh, commit where it increased the version yet again to 0.2.5-def. It then also automatically uh, triggered Julia Registrator, that is the bot that handles uh, registration of packages, and it triggered it and told it that this commit here, the one where it set the version to 0.2.4, that we would like that commit to become the new 0.2.4 version. Uh, and so automatically uh, a pull request was created now on the Julia registry for registering that particular version of string builders. All right, so at this point, if everything uh, goes smoothly, then this uh, PR here in the registry will be automatically merged. At that point, our version is officially available in the Julia registry. Um, but we don't know that yet, right? So it could be that we made a mistake or something like that and that the bot here says, no, you cannot actually register this uh, particular release here. And so that's the reason why all these changes that we made locally here in String Builders are made in a branch and not on main or the main or master uh, branch because we don't yet know whether our new version will actually make it through the process or whether it might be rejected. So what happens next is that if you have TagBot installed on this repository here, then whenever this PR in the Julia registry is accepted and merged, then TagBot in your local repository will at that point apply a tag to the right commit uh, that was actually accepted by the registry as the official version 0.2.4. And then it will also merge this release branch into your main or master branch so that that reflects uh, the new version uh, of your uh, package. So at the end of the day, this is sort of, uh, you know, there are a fair number of steps involved. There are some delays involved here while you wait for the general registry process to run through. But as a package author, the experience is very, very simple. If you want to release a new version, you just start that command here in uh, VS Code uh, and it does everything for you. You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to manually edit Project Toml to increase, increase versions. You don't have to uh, leave a, com a comment on your GitHub repository triggering registr registrator or anything like that. You just run that one command here inside Visual Studio Code, and then from there on out, everything else runs via bots and automatically, and your new version will be released. All right, those are all the new features that uh, we wanted to demo uh, in this uh, short video here. Um, I want to thank everyone who contributed to that. Uh, obviously, the core team uh, of uh, Zach, Sebastian, and myself uh, did a lot of work uh, over the last year, but we had so many other contributors 
and uh, the extension really would not be uh, where it is without uh, their help. So thank you. Um, if anyone is interested in helping out with this extension, um, please, uh, please do. Uh, we really welcome contributions. Uh, we can use them uh, uh, very well. Um, and with that, uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of JuliaCon. <laughs>